<laughs> Welcome to Cool Life Podcast, brought to you by TheRealThingDating.com. www.TheRealThingDating.com. Polydor Records for out scouting. This girl grabbed my bangs oh. and ran my head right to the speaker. Oh. And everyone here, like, just, yeah. When we shot the scene in Goodwill Hunting, I didn't know who most of these people were at the time. I mean, they weren't stars. It was Gus Van Sant that, that directed it. Gus Van Sant was on the floor with Matt Damon's Will character. Hunting. I didn't even know who Matt Damon was at that time. I'm Eva John. I'm a former candidate for local government. I was a children's television entertainer, and I love this world. And I believe we should take care of each other and have a lot of fun along the way. Welcome to Cool Life. Here we go. <laughs> and now, a scene from the motion picture Goodwill Hunting. This is a scene between comedian and actor Bruce Hunter in the role of the NSA agent and Matt Damon in the role of Will Hunting. Robert Talvano is silent in this scene as an NSA officer. So why do you think I should work for the National Security Agency? Well, you'd be working on the cutting edge. You'd be exposed to the kind of technology that you wouldn't see anywhere else because we've classified it. Super string theory, chaos math, advanced algorithms. Code breaking. Well, that's one aspect of what we do. Oh, come on. I mean, that is what you do. You guys handle 80% of the intelligence workload. Is seven times the size of the CIA. And now, please join in on part one of my two part conversation with Bruce Hunter. Actor, comedian, writer, producer, director, painter, and a kind and gentle human being. Gemini Award winner for Best Individual or Ensemble Performance for Atomic Betty. Nominated for Canadian Comedy Award for Writing and nominated for another Gemini Award for Puppets Who Kill Best Ensemble Performance. Welcome back to Cool Life Podcast. I'm Eva John and our guest continuing today, Mr. Bruce Hunter. Actor, comedian, writer, director, teacher, philosopher. <laughs> philosopher. Producer. <laughs> so much more. And so much, 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 much more. So for the career that you've been enjoying, yeah. you have seen you know, the burgeoning opening of a career where you discovered you were in demand and got to the point where you were working on some of the best productions available in, in any country. Um, what would you identify as the differences that you see between your early part of your career or the maybe smaller production values and what that's like when you're working on the big Hollywood produced show? Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> I mean, you've been on sets, obviously, you know what it's like. I mean, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem uh, th that different, you know, like, you don't really know the difference until after the thing has been produced and people react to it. You know, then you kind of see what you got yourself into, in a way, you know, because up to that point, like, pardon me? It's interesting. So yeah, well, until I mean, like, after it comes out and then you'll see the yeah, reactions. Because okay. all trailers look alike. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. all scripts look like paper with writing on them until somebody does something with it, right? It's mm -hmm. the, you know, you show me a 120 page script. It doesn't look any different than any other 100 page, 120 page script till I open it up and start reading it, you know? Uh, and even if it's a good script, <clears throat> doesn't mean that it'll ever become anything unless all the other elements fall into place, you know. So you don't know um, 
you know, I could be in a small production of something that somebody's done. Um, and it doesn't really look that much different than a big production, depending on what day you're there shooting it. You know, <laughs> you might be out in a Sometimes. field where there's lots of lots of vehicles and stuff. And other times you're in a tiny little room. But when there's a, a lot of money in a production, when there's mm-hmm. when there's um, you know, I mean, the snacks are different. <laughs> the the dress rooms. <laughs> well, are not always. Different. I mean, you know, you'd think. I mean, they all buy their snacks from the same corner store, or you know, the place that they get. You know, so it's nothing's really that different. You know, it's you might see a famous person on set. And that doesn't always happen, but you might see a, or you have a good scene. You get to do a scene with one of the stars in in the show, but it's you're you're still being driven over there by a guy in a vehicle. You know what I mean? It doesn't, or you have to walk or take the train or whatever it is that you have to do to get to See, that. Thing. That's, but once that's you're in difference. that room, there's a big difference between walking and taking a train. Oh, no, I know, but once you're in that room, it's always the same. It's a guy with a camera and and uh, and another actor, possibly, and that's it. I mean, for example, um, in Goodwill Hunting, when we shot the scene in Goodwill Hunting, I didn't I didn't know who uh, I didn't know who most of these people were at the time. I mean, they weren't stars, you know. That was um, the start the start of some important careers that were happening in front of your absolutely. eyes. Absolutely. I mean, do you feel that you could sense a certain amount of ability and talent and conduct uh, in those those young performers who were about to make a big impact on the industry? Well, you didn't. You wouldn't know. I mean, that's that's the thing. You don't. You don't. Re- I mean, in that particular case, it's different because there was there was um, famous people that were involved in the production of right. it, right? Sure. Um, so it was sort of a big, and it's a major film. So there is some differences that you know going into it, <laughs> but you never know what's going to take. I mean, even you know, uh, it's it's when a lot of the things fall into place. That they, you know, and who knows if that movie would have won awards in another year if it was up against other films that might have been, you know, might have been dealing with more important issues. You know, there might have been a film about, about, you know, residential schools or some might have might have been a movie that everybody loved because it, it said something. And if you're competing with that in the same year, you might not have got an Academy Award, you know? Yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of a lot of elements that take place within. I don't want to say you know, it didn't deserve a, a, an Oscar, but, you know, a, a lot of times um, people's careers, movies and all this kind of stuff are they happen because a lot of the things fall into place. Right. Well, I mean, even you could an NBA finals, right? One team up against another. One team is, you know, is a pretty competitive team, it stumbles along the way in their season, and they don't get to live to see the day in the final when they can take down the team that should be taken down and they hand the crown to someone else. It, that's a kind of a formula that I guess it exists when you have a battle of kings, a battle of you know, highly uh, talented people in whatever their field, you know, I guess the timing is everything. Uh, if that film is up. Yeah, up, because I'm sure against. there's, I'm sure there is incredible films out there right. that even like young film makers have made and then things didn't go in their favor. That film is still out there and it's a brilliant film. Right but they didn't get the accolades that they deserved at the mm-hmm. time because the things weren't in place for that to happen. But that doesn't diminish the film any further. It just, it just, uh, it's, it's just part of the whole picture, you know, that they didn't get at that time. But there's lots of stuff out there that you, you, when you look at it, you go, why didn't this get nominated or why didn't any, why do haven't people not seen this? This is an incredible film. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff out there too, right? Well, but they uh, it's a fluid you know, they, it's a fluid thing, right? Because it is fluid. It has to do with um, opinions and feelings, and it, it's an emotional 
it's an emotional industry. I mean, in, in the sport, you score a point, there you are. You know, you're up against that other team, you're, you're ahead. But, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, did you make not, someone it's laugh? Not, uh, yeah, it's in those particular cases, a goal is a goal. Right. You know, but in, in the creative world, you've got people voting for this stuff. You know, it's like uh, it's like figure skating. Mm -hmm. You've got judges, yeah. you know, it's not as easy as, you know, three scores, uh, three uh, goals and you win the game. There's no denying it, you know. You know that, well, I mean, they do they, like in figure, figure skating, they do have to execute certain moves, but the weight of the score, if everyone's doing the same move, you're all doing like a triple sow cow or whatever, yeah. right? It's just somebody like, that does it just a little bit better. Right. Or they hit the marks or whatever, and then it's based on that. But even even that, there's still favoritism. There's still, you know, uh, patriotism that goes involved in that. It's hard to avoid those kind of things when you're uh, choosing things. But in the film business, there is tons of people that are members that vote, you know, that vote on things. And, oh, they're and it's voting. like a political campaign. You've got you've got a campaign and push for a person too, and get them in other people's faces. Right. Exactly. I mean, you when you get into the Oscar season, everybody starts putting out ads, right, for their their guys, yeah, for your stuff, consideration, you know? for your consideration. For an Oscar, I've never even thought of that guy being in that. Wow, he was really good in that. It's you know, Mark Damon, Matt, what? <laughs> yeah, you know. And then, of course, you know, decision like all of a sudden, somebody does a film, and then they're rocketed into stardom. You know, they're now a star and, and, and that's the other thing is, <clears throat> is, is the, the perpetual trying to maintain that right. that's a problem because people have to try to maintain that lifestyle, that, that place they are in. Right. And I, I think that becomes a really difficult thing. Same thing with musicians, you know, you, you, you go through a miserable life trying to be a musician and you're working on your stuff and you write an awesome album because all the pain that you've gone through created this amazing album. So now you're a star because you've got this amazing album. What do you do next? Okay. Like, is your next album going to be as heartfelt as, or are you, you know, or are you, are you trying to recreate that pain Mm -hmm. to try to be able to write like that or do you even understand what is the impetus that made you that great you know now that, now that you're a star and you're not in pain you're not in the subway dragging around your your bass guitar <laughs> you've got a limo yeah exactly so yeah. how do you what is it the thing what is the thing that you understand about it that you know is the thing. Now, if you're writing to try to sustain the, the, to be that level of artist all the time, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons again. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to do it because it means something to you. And who cares what anybody else thinks? You've got to do it because it matters to you. And other people will hopefully see that. But if you're trying to make something because you need to stay, you know, have that, have your fancy car fixed up, you know, or whatever, or live in that bigger house, then that's when you see artists become bland and uninteresting. But like I mean, you does, everyone, does everyone do it? A dentist, you know, it's like, like got to you know, keep up with their, their totals, you know, so that they can, you know, keep that car and that house and and you keep the the family living the life that they've gotten used to it's like how many fillings do we yeah. need to do this week? it's but, it's ego again yeah right you know i mean but when with you an think artist... of like the the like schitt's creek for example right when you think of the characters in schitt's creek i mean it's it's basically green acres in a way yeah. you know yeah it's it's um a country going out to the country you're meeting the country bumpkins and trying to have the rich you know, high class sensibilities in a small town. You know, and, it's, and you it's, you were you were in that production. You performed. You were able to see from the inside out. Again, a highly successful, you know, dream come true as far as a TV series. Any anybody in the industry, that's what they are looking for. But again, because it's an art, an art needs an audience. 
as part of its justification for its existence that if a tree falls in a forest, right? Yeah. Then it's like, did this actually get heard or observed? Or, you know, if if you just put the production on for the sake of itself, that isn't that isn't enough. And in fact, it's well, a like very when selfish people try to recreate do. a show, like so, for example, there was a number of years where Modern Family was the was the show that everybody wanted you to like when you went in to pitch a TV show, they would always say to you, well, we're looking for a modern family. Right. Right. Well, there's already a modern family. It's called Modern Family. <laughs> Have you seen it? <laughs> so what you're looking for, what Lovely. you want is them to take a chance on a new show and give it that kind of backing that that modern family had when it started or some of these other shows which they don't because now what they want to do is they want a modern family so they want you to create a version of modern family because they know that works but they don't understand why it works they just know that that works let's make that let's create that let's recreate that that's why you get other shows that are similar to it that's why you see a whole years and years of the show of the family unit. Right. Yeah. You know, doing a show, mom, dad, the idiot son, the all in the family kind of attitude. Right. You know? Well, I mean, I think that started back that. with Leave It to Beaver. And that's that started like way, way, way back that they realized this works, right? Yeah. And it's and, it, and then when they when they realized that they could mess with that structure, then the new things are born, like Family Guy and The Simpsons, mm -hmm. you know, or in the reverse of that, The Simpsons right. and Family Guy. But, you know, th those are the, you know, they're, they're making fun of that. And then you've got all the list of other shows that are exactly like that. They have the, um, uh, the husband who's a works at a post office and the wife who's you know what I mean and they got that one room that they come into and everybody <laughs> applauds when they enter into the room it's right Dick it's, Van Dyke show <laughs> the Dick Van Dyke show yeah. Mary Tyler Moore yeah. it's all you know uh, they know the format so well you know um, and that's you know but and then they just plug something in and think it's going to work and it doesn't always work but, because but there's so many it, it other little always, elements. It doesn't always work, but the thing is, it could work with good writing, right? I mean, here in Canada, we've had things like King of Kensington, right? Which went on mm -hmm. for a beautiful work. Al Waxman had yeah. um, get, given work to people for you know decades because of having a formula that works. Using that platform as a springboard of what is a situation of you know family and people that care about each other and you know make us laugh make us cry or put it on its head and call it the adams family right and right. um but it works and i i guess that's the the easy way out if but it doesn't say. always work it works in in the you know the technical side of it all works but what makes it better is when there is a bunch of different individuals that we like those people. Like, for example, I was reading an article about, about um, Happy Days. Okay, right. And uh, they're talking about, you know, when the first Happy Days came out, the Fonz wasn't in it. Right, right. Right? Once the Fonz got involved in the show, once they brought that character, his character in, all of a sudden it became even more interesting. People started loving that character right loved him as an actor playing that role they could have had a different guy in playing that fonzie role and it might not have worked right you know but because those elements that get entered into it it may look exactly the same it may look exactly you know the format's the same even the jokes might be the same but it's the people in it that make the difference you give a, a guitar to a guy and say play this and you give the same guitar and ask the guy to play, a, a, give it to a different guitarist and ask him to play the same thing. That's the difference right. is they might play the same thing, but it's the it's the spirit of that act, that actor or that a musician that makes it special. You know. But you when, see, when, that's a when, perception. Uh, that's a perception and it needs an audience for that perception. And that's where it'll be like why why being a performer is always going to be a little bit different from dentistry. 
because you know you're gonna fix a tooth, a tooth is a tooth. When Jimi but... Hendrix played the Star Spangled Banner, nobody'd heard the Star Spangled Banner like that before. Right. Nobody even thought Ever. of it. Ever. You see this guy do this incredible thing; it becomes iconic, right? Um, because he's doing it. You could have had somebody else play it with a guitar, and nobody would have given half a about it. But because, and that's the moment. That's when all the things sort of happen at the right time, you know? Yeah. Uh, because it's that person is there for when that's supposed to happen. And that's why they're part of that thing. So that's part of the reason why it isn't, it doesn't, it doesn't all become about that person, but it also becomes part of the, of the events around it. Right. The people watching, the people open for that interested in that want that they want that they want the fawns that, you know they're open that for that that unique combination of the whole happy days um cast and yet having you know the arthur fonzarelli character join that cast oh yes i have seen that show a time or two but i yeah. actually know the character's name and had a big crush on him in my younger years why not but um mm -hmm. the, that came at the right time when people were nostalgic for the 50s right and yeah. you know there was a while a time when you know you go to the stores and for some reason poodle skirts were back the big wide skirts with a poodle on it and the <laughs> right, right, shoes. Right. there was a yeah. thing going on and they brought back cat's eye glasses and they had all these retro shops that sprung up um in in big cities I mean, look at all these shows that they've tried to bring back, you know, like, you know, the show was might have been successful years ago. And then they try to bring it back, thinking that it's going to be a, an easy fit. Right. We're going to bring this show back and and look how many of those kind of shows fail. Because Will and Grace, Degrassi. There are elements Degrassi about around. it. Yeah, there are elements of it that aren't there. Yeah. You know? You can't just you just can't take the ingredients and throw them back in there and think you're going to get the same kind of thing. No, there's so many other th things that are going on. Yeah, like other uh, p you know the sensibilities of people that are watching it, the 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 clients that buy it, the people that are watching it, the the what's going on in the world around it. All of those things are are elements that that play into it that give it its success or its failure. Right. depending on what happens well will and grace happened at a time when it was it was groundbreaking in itself right yeah Pe people were not it came it's almost like it needed to be there while people were not ready for it and th the world has changed so much there is such um it, you look back on it and you think well we were so unevolved at that time and this having that type of entertainment was almost like one of the stepping stones towards that wider conversation of why aren't we more evolved? And now right. we get to such a point where we are so evolved that when they bring the show back and it's kind of like, yeah, so yeah, yeah we're already past it. <laughs> We've already gone past it. Right. Right. It's not as, uh, as it's not as um, groundbreaking. No. Oh. Because we've already we've already established it, we get it. Yeah. So that's Funny. why it's hard to bring stuff back because it, they had like, good writers, obviously fantastic performers, yeah. and uh, it just somehow didn't have its staying power, you know. And you get something like like Will and Grace coming back and saying it deserves to to stay, but it it actually it couldn't, right? It wasn't yeah, it wasn't no, ringing the same bell the same exactly. way. Yeah. Because people move on, people people's sensibilities move on. There, there's a flood of 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 influences of things all around them that they're not there ready for. That's the same thing of why shows get all of a sudden canceled. Some event happens, and then everybody goes, "Oh, why was I laughing at that before?" Mm. Because this thing happened, and mm -hmm. I, you know, so people sort of change their mind about stuff. Right. And now, that's I, why stars, sometimes they're a star and the next day nobody wants to hire them. But, but if I you know? say that the this was a great, such and such a show, such a great show, such great writers. I mean, you've seen it from from both sides of the camera and mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is the a formula that's working, but the inception of that formula that's working as a writer. Like if, if we go back, say, to Schitt's Creek, 
where that mm-hmm. formula worked all over the place, the writing, the performing, everything, right? Costumes. Oh my God, please, please. <laughs> I'd like to buy some of those costumes. Like, <laughs> right. like being within that whole milieu of such a stellar production, can you, can you sense that when you're walking on the set? Can you sense that, that what you're working with is like, comedic genius well you you can when you can sense it when you go on to a show that is doing well that it's already successful right because everybody there is an ease to it you know because people feel that they know they they're into something good and they like their job and they enjoy going to work and when those elements are in place um things move quite well you know and and everything everybody's sort of in on it everybody knows what the what the thing is um i think what happens eventually and this isn't shit's creek but uh, eventually shows that are successful eventually have they struggle trying to maintain that original spark you know and they always try to add new things because they're they don't know what it is that is missing you know, to the thing, they can't keep keep it going the way they had it. They kept you know? bringing in new little kids. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I mean, they, they become up. desperate trying to figure it out, and the audience smells it. Right, and they I'm can glad see they the didn't hire me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they they can they can smell the desperation in it, and it's almost kind of a joke because you everybody knows it from watching television. They. Right. They know the story. They can see when they start throwing stars in there that they mm. need, you know, um, they need better uh, numbers, you know. Um, but like in Schitt's Creek, what's what's very what's very clear about that is that these are all pros. I mean, these, you know, Eugene and and uh, and Catherine, they're they've been doing it a long time. They're very funny. Um, um and 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 his son is a brilliant writer these guys are they know what side their butter is breaded on (laughs) shall we say they know what works for them they play those characters very well we like those characters and we want to see them move from you know a little problem to the next one right but eugene levy he's been around for so long his skills and ability like they they that doesn't just grow on trees that's not accidental it's not a formula that just you're like okay we've got a great script he's bringing different types of seasoning and spices from from decades of understanding an audience and understanding humor which is beautiful you know way beyond yeah well he's been on stage he's been doing he did second city for a long time and he was you know writing for sctv and being in sctv and I mean, these guys, they, they, they fine tune their skills. They know, they know how to get a laugh, even from some stupid line, you know, Catherine O'Hara will deliver a line, which if you were to read on the paper, it's just a line. It doesn't mean anything, but because of the way she puts her character around it, 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 it makes you laugh because you understand what her struggle her character struggle is you know so you 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 get those characters you understand their their egos well i mean because it's all about losing or gaining gaining status that's what comedy is all about right right Right. it's watching people fall on their face it's about laughing at people falling on their face Mm -hmm. you know it's um it's watching rich people fail right you know um because it's carried by a performer who you know performers who know what they're doing and mm-hmm. just eugene Le- levy alone and Catherine o'hara just if it was just that that's it no one else is, is getting onto this tv show that would be amazing but the fact that they've also brought in so many other people over you're <laughs> starting with you well john hemphill yes. right. john hemphill was um he uh when i would go down to second city he was uh he played uh, in in the show he plays the uh the mechanic right he runs the mechanic right. shop right. and and john hempel was at second city for years and years mm-hmm. and years um was doing the the main stage there and he was um oh, hilarious and and 
he had it down so good. He was so funny. It's like he didn't have to do much to get lots of laughs. Right. Like when you when I would watch him at Second City, I was very impressed with him because he was just so comfortable in his place, you know, and and uh, a, a huge favorite. So it was really nice to see him get on that show because they all, you know, they all knew him uh, from uh, uh, Second City and stuff. And um, uh, so to see him uh, get on that show was really, really made me happy because he deserved to be there. And, and truly they're building on an existing chemistry that. Yeah. Um, they yeah. And they, and they expand. know him and they trust mm -hmm. him and they've done work with him in the past and, and uh, and he fits in beautifully like all the other characters. They're all they're all very interesting characters. I mean, if you had a show that would none of the characters were interesting, you don't have a show. I mean, Arrested Development, all of those characters are very defined. They all have their particular status and idea about themselves. They're all very clear. So when they open their mouth, even if they're saying something just really straight, we laugh because we know what they're really thinking. We know where they're coming from. We know why they're saying that because, you know, they're trying to take care of themselves or whatever. Mm -hmm. We know what their position is. Same thing on Family Guy and stuff. All the characters are very defined. We're going to take a little <laughs> break okay. and talk to some of our supporters and who are sponsors for our little, little podcast show. Excellent. So we'll take a break coming back with Mr. Bruce Hunter on Cool Life Podcast. Those lonely days of lockdowns and isolation are gone for good. Go to www.therealthingdating.com. That's www.therealthingdating.com. It's time to share. Share your time, share your life, share your love. www.therealthingdating.com. Join for free. Upgrade at any time, starting at just $5.99 a month. www.therealthingdating.com Because it's time. You're listening to The Cool Life Podcast. We'll be back in 3, 2, 1. This is the Caramel Bar Aliens commercial, starring Bruce Hunter. This is not a sponsored video clip. You're Stonehenge, pure genius. <laughs> Those Earthlings, they still haven't figured it out. Uh, yeah, probably never will. I'll tell you something, though. Your pyramids are classic. But the best, yeah. sir, the best yeah. is how you get that soft flowing caramel into the caramel bar. Wait a minute, that, that wasn't me. I thought you did that. It wasn't me. If you didn't do it and I didn't do it. Who was it? Fools. The indigenous <laughs> culture, um, think about generations like living uh, in in you know, eight generations ahead, like to think, how is this going to affect the future of our, our, our people and everything else? It's so it's being aware of what you do now and how it affects the future, yeah. you know, being, you know, understanding how do, how do we sustain our life force? You know, um, there's, there's more to it than simply making certain everyone has somewhere warm to sleep and food to eat. That's, that's a basic Everyone should have somewhere warm to sleep and food to eat. And then when we once we have all of that, we're able to think on a higher level. And that's when we're able to do things like create the wheel or do things like figure out, you know, solar energy. And I think that's part of the true evolution of life. And when we learn to do those things and and say, okay, well, on top of it, I think it always comes back to the arts as well, that when we are in a, a safe comfortable place then the creativity that's part of human nature can blossom can flourish and i think it's beautiful i think it's necessary and i think it's part of what gives meaning to these special moments in life when there's more to our lives than just working you stand under a starry sky and it inspires you it makes you feel something it makes you wish mm -hmm. there was someone beside you 
And then it makes you want to do what? What? You want to hug that person. You want to sing them a song. You want to tell them that they're beautiful, as beautiful as the stars. And I think that's when you start to see there is a deeper experience in life. And it's nice if we can be good caretakers, take care of our planet. And then we can also find those great talents that lie in all of us. Speaking of which, speaking of which, and our great and unique talents, uh, starting with you, my dear Bruce Hunter, knowing that you've um, taken this time as a, a careful and caring man, thinking about your environment and the the atmosphere of performance in the future. There are some ups and downs in performance, a lot of perks or a lot of um, humiliations and disgraces, uh, miscarriages of art, but um, you've managed to stick it out. Was there something that has kept you coming back to this industry as a performer? I like the term miscarriages of art. That's uh, that's an interesting term. You're welcome. And you can use uh, it anytime you want. Just great. Send $20 to my uh, house. <laughs> every time. I might use it again. $20. Um, so I'm sorry. What, what was the question? Why do I keep coming back <clears throat> to doing this? Yeah. Um, like in spite of everything. Well, I think that, uh, you know, whatever. I think in my particular case, it's... Um, there isn't a lot that I can do other than than what I do, like who I am, right? You know, the things that I like and the things that 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 juice my existence are 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 things that sort of get me to the next day, you know, like um, right, right. um so I, I don't really think about it as an industry that I'm either in or out of, you know, as if I have to re-enter into the age, into this uh, business because the business is kind of always there and it evolves into different things. And, um, and then hopefully you're lucky enough to have an agent or someone that <laughs> believes in you or represents you and goes, you'd be good for this. And right. I, I, I'm going to represent you and, so that's what sort of keeps you in the business is is the people that are in the business trying to make money off of you know your skills you know yeah. i if if it all shut down and um it wasn't available for uh, people i think people would still be artistic i mean i would still be doing what i'm doing uh painting and performing and maybe trying to teach people how to do comedy and stuff um, and I wouldn't let it affect me. I mean, the fact that the business isn't always there for you because you don't always get jobs and stuff is not, it's not of, um, it's not a deciding factor for me to not be in the arts, right. you know, right, right. you're either an artist or you're not right. Like you're either somebody that, um, because it, it, it being an actor is only one thing that you do that's creative, you know, uh, in the creative world. It's one faction that allows you to make a little bit of money, but it's not the thing that that makes you want to paint a picture or uh, get on stage with people and have fun with those people or entertain people and make them laugh. It's not the the business is is sort of it's an as well as it's not an instead of. Does that make sense? Yes, I get that for sure. As yeah, far as it's, it's sort as of far around. as knowing, knowing yeah. that you are creative and your creativity, it doesn't come and go just because you've been hired for something. Yeah, exactly. Be, be, if you're an artist to begin with, or if mm -hmm. you're creative and you like to, I mean, even the term artist is an odd term, but if if you're a person that just likes to create and likes to right. paint or is just into creating things, um, then the more you do it, the better you get at it. And the better you get at it, then if somebody wants to hire you, more than likely you'll you'll do that. <laughs> you know, you'll get that job or um and I think that's uh, I think people when they like when I used to teach at Second City, I would get many students that would come to me and go, Well, how do I get on the main stage? Mm -hmm. They they were more concerned about being an actor, like, you know, all the, the 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 variations of 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 things that you get for being an actor like fame and all these other stupid things that don't matter 
um, as opposed to just being just being an artist that's capable of doing pretty much anything. I mean, you know, when people decide, well, I don't, I'm a musician. All I do, I play music. I'm, I'm a musician. Um, as soon as people start identifying with the thing and they, and they say, that's who I am, that's a mistake because then you are creating a world that you are basically have to achieve. Right. You know, you're, you're, you're you're running, you know. You're running along, going. I'm an a I'm an actor, as opposed to somebody that just does stuff and uh, you ends up working as an actor one day. Right. And one day I might be working as a dishwasher. Right. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I'm not putting the same kind of sense and love into that activity as I would acting. Right. Oh, for sure. You know. If you're your if you're able is... to balance that that out as a human being, I mean that has to do with growing as a human being enough to not shame yourself for doing something other than your imagined image of success. Or yeah, well, I think people people make the mistake of becoming things. Right. Like if you're a if you're a lawyer, you've studied to be a lawyer, then you your mind is wrapped around the idea that I am a lawyer. And uh, then I have to act like a lawyer mm -hmm. and I have to do lawyery things, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to I've learned this legal jargon and I understand the law and it's just extra stuff for me to have tools. There are extra tools that I have. It doesn't mean I'm a lawyer. It just means I can do that stuff, you know, and I think people make the make the mistake of becoming the thing that they want to be or whatever and then they're then they're always fighting with that they always have to be that they're always if they don't get a job or they don't get hired then then they start questioning their own um perception of who they are or i mean that's you know sadly what maybe caused a lot of people to jump out of windows is when the stock market crashed right in the, in the 20s exactly and, of course, it's they a identify with failure Right. Just because like you shouldn't identify with success. If you identify with success and think, oh, I'm the greatest performer, or the greatest actor in the world. As soon as you start doing that, it's it's a disaster. You're setting yourself up for disaster. It's a, it's Don't a philosophy anything. of yourself, the philosophy yeah. of, of your the way you're defining yourself. I know it's, it's interesting because it was well, it came up in um, it was a book made of, into a film, The Razor's Edge. Mm -hmm. profound philosophical work which was um you know the the star actor was comedian bill murray mm -hmm. at the time a long time ago and his performance i thought was superb simply because i think the whole accident of life happening to just anybody who may or may not figure it all out i think that was carried beautifully on the face of a comedian because i mean that is everyone stumbling through and hoping at some point it'll make sense to us carrying that message, you know, that kind of a turning point in the film, worst time of, of his life possibly to then discover that there is more to an existence that can be found even when they're washing dishes. Right. And that. Oh if yeah. I mean, you understand know, your existence, right? Yeah. You don't, you don't just because you wash dishes doesn't make you a dishwasher. Right. <laughs> you know, right. just because you're a philosopher doesn't make you an expert in anything. It You know, just because you, you know, stumble across something doesn't make that that's who you are. You know, just because you discovered something doesn't make you the explorer now. And everybody sort of makes those mistakes of becoming something or they, they want to become something because then they have an identity. You know, you, you've got to, it's, I am not this is an important thing for you to say to yourself. I am not this. I am not this anger I feel in this situation. Right. I am not this actor that uh, people want to make me or I want to make myself. I, I am just a entity. I'm just a person that has some skill because I was paying attention <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, to the things that were offered me uh, on my plate, you know, when I 
you know, because I, I draw a lot. When I was a kid, I was always drawing. And uh, that doesn't make me an artist necessarily. It doesn't make me a, a good painter. It just means that, that it's a skill that I that I have. I could stick to it and just do that and become really good at it, which most people uh, can if they stumble on something and they do en do it enough. Their body just takes it over. It just knows knows. It becomes it, a like, skill, but there's a point where yeah. when a skill is just goes beyond being a craft and and then it goes to the level of art. It's I think it's not really so much that the artist names themselves an artist. You're an artist when the wider world even if that wider world is an audience of one, can identify what you've done as gone, going beyond a craft. And it's just, at what point is your skill of drawing more than a craft? Um, I think you'll know when people won't be able to resist it, right? Well, I think you'll, you will make something, I mean, it all comes down to how you feel about it. I mean, if you make something that you are proud of, right. that's enough. You don't need someone to critique it and tell you that it's good or it's like this or it should you know. be enough. It it is it it yes it should be enough. That is but, enough. But. I mean, you shouldn't have to. Uh, I mean, you know the work that goes into it. You know what you did uh, to make it happen. You know the the moment that you're doing it and that you're enjoying it. That's what it's all about. It's in the moment that we live our lives it's the moment we taste the food you know that we're we're living right. it's where the rubber hits the pavement that's that's it about everything we do it doesn't matter if you're an actor or a writer or a musician or a, you know a lawyer you know it's in that it's in that moment that you do the right thing or make the right choice or lay the pen to paper and make that line, draw that line that is very expressive because you've got kind of gotten out of the way and let the creative force go through you, you know, and don't, and then all of a sudden, you know, you know, people, they do something successful and then they, then they fight with that because they have to keep doing, they have to be as successful as the last thing they just did. You know, of that course. thing that put them on the map, they have to recreate that. And not just for themselves, but there's a whole pile of people around them expecting that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as exactly. opposed to just, um, you know, and, and not be, not owning it. You know, people that say, do something or they draw something and then they they go on about uh, I own this. Well, you don't own it. You were you were there when the creative forces were at play, and you just happened to be the individual that picked it up out of the sky as it passed through you. You know, it doesn't belong to you. Anybody but that thinks that they own anything, it doesn't. Is, it doesn't belong renters. to you. It we're all renters. You, but it's something unique from you. And knowing that if you've done something that is quite unique, if you've done something that is you know, something that can't necessarily be repeated by someone else under the similar or same circumstances. I think there's there's an acknowledgement that is still due to the unique creativity of an individual, as much as sharing it. Well, sure, but we don't want to get we don't want to get too uh, influenced by ego. Because ego is a, is a, is a, can cause a lot of problems. You may have like entered the wrong industry. Ego sir. can do some bad things to you. <laughs> For sure, yeah. I said you may have entered the wrong industry, sir. Because... Well, that's the thing. I mean, i i've 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 never uh, i never wanted to be famous. I've I've always uh, tried to avoid that. I don't like the way. If people think they know me, looking at me like they know me because they've made choices about me, they might hate me because they saw me in something that they didn't like or whatever. But that's not who I am. And that, right? But now, if, that's, if you're that's hated, their perception of me. If you're hated, they'll let you know. I mean, like surely, like over the years, have you created something, performed in something that people found offended, offensive, and expressed that? Oh, I'm. Sure, I probably have, especially if you do improvisation, you know, right. or you're doing comedy, if you're doing comedy, or you're doing shows or stand up and, uh, and you say something that might be offensive, there's people out there that are offended. 
Um, I'm sure I've offended people before. I mean, I did a show once where the suggestion, it was at Second City, I was just sort of filling in for somebody, just joining them. And somebody had suggested something about um, somebody that stutters. That was it. So I, I, I played a guy that was stuttering because right. uh, that was the suggestion they gave me. Right. Well, somebody in the audience, uh, friend has Tourette's. So they were very upset with that. So they wrote a letter to Second City. And then Second City said to me, what are you doing? You know, coming down here and do it. You know, I was invited up on the stage to do this. But um, somebody was offended by it. And, and of course, turned it into a thing and blew it all up, which it wasn't that at all. It was uh, most people sort of saw it for what it was. But this person saw it and was offended by it and then ran with that in their head. And it became more than it was for them. Right. It became more of a problem for them. But I can't, I can't be worried about what everybody thinks. Well, you know? something that was it's done in such a light way. Still, it had a ramification. Was there some true closure to that situation? Um, I mean, closure in the sense that. Um, in a way, I had to explain to the producer what actually happened because they heard it all from this person who wrote the letter, right? right? They didn't know, and actually nobody at Second City pointed it out. It wasn't a problem for anybody there. Nobody even thought about it. Mm -hmm. It was a regular show. It's somebody, somebody saw that and took a great offense to it and felt that it was in their best interest to uh, mention it. And then then I, I heard all about it, right? You know, like I was to blame, you know, as if I did something wrong, which I didn't. But um, that's the way things get out of control, you know? I think especially with comedy where it can, you know, especially when you're imp improvising, you're not, you know, not scripted, it's not uh, any forethought other than your experiential being bringing all of you, all of your wisdom and, humor and tragedy into a moment and someone throws a word out there <laughs> and you yeah. use that to springboard into a scene. It's well, I mean, a... you got to be, I mean, as, as an, as an artist, you've got to be kind of aware of people's feelings. And when you're, when you're dealing with, with certain situations, there are ways of handling these topics without offending anybody, or at least you're making fun of the right people. <laughs> or the right situation that you're there are trends fun of. there are you're trends. making fun of yeah you're making fun of um our perspective on it like how i feel uh, uh, about it how stupid i am you know you make jokes about yourself rather than somebody else you don't you know what i mean so you 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 shine the light on your um shortcomings in a way um, as opposed to calling somebody a name or any of that kind of humor, right. if you can call it humor. Well, I think when it comes down to name calling, then that that shows a, a real lack of skill. That's where yeah. skill comes in. If you can do something more than just name calling, which is why people you know pay money to sit down and be entertained by someone like you. And so, well, hopefully you'll be a little bit more clever than than that, and exactly. they're laughing at something different than that. They're laughing at the situation that you've created around that, or some of the characters in it that aren't the person. You know, the, some of these other funny characters that are around it. You know, going at, at this moment where, where you've had you know a wealth of experience and seeing what works, what doesn't work, you know, who and you know will take offense as opposed to see the humor in something. I and mean, that's part of it too. It's it's like weaving and choosing the right kinds of fibers and fabrics and colors to bring together something beautiful uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, what you make as a weaver on your first day is very different from what you make as a weaver uh, after 20 years, what you draw into your comedy as a performer on your, on your very first performance, it's going to be so different now that you have a, a wealth of experience of as a human being along with your experience as an artist right that's that's what makes it yeah wonderful. i think i think you know the the uh, the idea that people um you I mean you want people to sort of 
see the humor in it. You don't want to hurt anybody's right. uh, feelings, you know. Um, not so as a goal, I would think. Th- not right? as a goal. No, not at all. You want them laughing. I mean, that's that's. I think that's the goal for every every comedian. I mean, there are other people that will come out and they just want to shock people. Right. You know, um, because that's the, they get off on that, you know, but um, that's not um, I just want to make people laugh. I want to make people feel good. You Which know, it's beautiful. It's yeah, healing. I, I don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> you know, I don't want anybody to feel crappy or you know what I mean? Or, or, or see what happens is sometimes people will see something and then they'll kind of relate it to themselves in a way. You know, do I do that sort of thing? Or I take great offense to them saying that because I do feel the same way as that character feels. Right. right. But I'm going to hide it because uh, admitting it is going to make me look like the thing they're talking about. So um, if you take on the responsibility of this as an offensive rule. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the same thing as what I was saying about I am not this. You know, you see something that might come close to your own situation or maybe a situation that you've been in and you did this, which could be considered bad. Um, but that's, you know, knowing that I am not this person. I, you know, I did this horrible thing that day, but that's not who I am. You know, and I, I think people I think people uh, have a tendency to get worried that because they're doing something that may be, you know, something they shouldn't be doing today that that all of a sudden now they're identified as that well people express you know, by themselves. other people too people express themselves these days immediately i mean have we ever lived in a time when you know being a so-called celebrity does not protect people anymore there used to be that silent agreement yeah something went wrong when a celebrity came out of a club drunk or whatever they it didn't make the news. They knew not, not And to... who cares? I mean, even if it's just a regular guy, if a regular guy comes out of a bar and he's drunk and being an asshole, people don't even think about it. They just think he's drunk. Right. And they're just going to walk away from him. But if it's a famous person coming out drunk, everybody's got a videotape and everybody's got to talk about it. He could be having just as much of a bad day as any other regular person. Yeah. Like, you know, when we see, when you bump into you know, famous people and they're short with you or they have no time for you. I mean, their lives are filled up with a whole bunch of just like everybody else, you know, but because we don't give them a break because we're expecting them to be at a different level of consciousness. And they're just regular people like everybody else, you know? Yeah. Give them a break. (laughs) The guy's upset today because everybody's bugging him, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he hasn't figured out the philosophy that his job is not a definition of his soul. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I said, I am not this. Right. You're constantly throwing these things away like flakes. They're coming off your body. You don't need this stuff. You, you're throwing it away. You got to get rid of it. I am not this. I am not an actor. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't want to be recognized. I just want to be an entity that is capable of doing anything rather than this, that is only capable of doing this. And that's the way everybody else frames me because that's what they need. They need that identity so they can understand who you are, but you don't have to be that. You can be all the things you want to be. You can be good at anything. If you put your mind to it, if, Right. That's if if you put your mind to it, if you put your love and your interest in in it, you you can pretty much do anything, at least at least enough to the point that you're satisfied by your take on it. And that's all you ever have to satisfy is yourself. Well, you would hope and when a performer finds it or just, you know, a human being finds it. So we're talking comedy philosophy. Mm -hmm. human existence (laughs) with Bruce Hunter. We're going to take a break to talk about some of our sponsors and supporters, and we'll be right back with Cool Life. (laughs) Excellent. Those lonely days of lockdowns and isolation are gone for good. Go to www.therealthingdating.com. That's www.therealthingdating.com. 
it's time to share. Share your time, share your life, share your love. www.therealthingdating.com Join for free. Upgrade at any time, starting at just $5.99 a month. www.therealthingdating.com Because it's time. This is Cool Life Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to Cool Life on your streaming service and on YouTube as Hellenique Today. That's H-E-L-E-N-I-Q-U-E Today. Because that helps us to bring more cool stuff to your ears. You're listening to The Cool Life Podcast. We'll be right back. And in theory, we are back. Yay. Mr. Bruce Hunter here at Cool Life Podcast. And so we're talking about great performances, comedy, drama, writing, producing, teaching, directing. And I wonder, with your background in improvisation, improv, do you find that working with certain directors, they realize the depth of your abilities and your talent? Do you ever find that this just will let you just take that script and just run with it and just let everything go f- like just in a, like a, a free fall for your abilities to improvise? <laughs> yeah, I don't think any director would want that entirely because um, they want to sort of have some control over where it goes because it could go it could get a bit out of control um but i've uh, there are some directors that don't have time for it because you know they they have only much so much time and everything is mm. worked out to the you know to the last dollar um but uh most uh, there are some directors that will let you improvise a little bit to see what they can get some little extra thing if they can right. have you do um i always uh like that uh a little bit because uh, sometimes you'll find yourself with extra lines or something else in into the thing but they don't always have a lot of time to do that or some people don't trust improvisation they mm-hmm. they don't um um they avoid it like when we were trying to pitch improv shows uh a lot of the uh, producers and stuff we would pitch it to didn't like it. it was so uncertain there was no you know it, it, it's too any anything could happen you know um but if if it's people that really know what they're doing you know it can be formed in whatever way i mean i did a <clears throat> i did a kodak commercial and the director rob courtley who is this uh, great director right um asked me to um you know, we work together to improvise um, this scene. And it's basically a, a director. The camera's really close on his face. And uh, as like I said, it was for a Kodak uh, film. And uh, uh, so it ended up being shown at a lot of Kodak conventions. And, you know, and, oh, and, yeah. uh, wow. and uh, it's, it, it went out quite a bit. Anyway, I, I wanted a bunch of awards for it. Um, but it was all improv. Right. And um, it's basically I'm a director talking into the camera as if I'm directing somebody right. uh, and giving getting them to do different things. And, and I'm on a I'm I'm on the camera and the camera's kind of moving around filming this guy. But you, it's all my it's me giving him direction and, right. and this freaky character that I am. Yeah. And um, and that was let's just make stuff up come up with a bunch of stuff and and I would go off and come up with some ideas and then I'd come in and play this character um this egotistical director uh trying to direct this person who is the uh is the uh, audience member looking at him trying to direct him and um (laughs) and that was fun and directed um, your way and improvised your way into winning awards amazing yeah it won a it won a bunch of awards it was edited really well and um and uh yeah no it it it, in fact uh one of the guys 
it, it had such a great reaction that people were trying to imitate it. Mm. And I remember a guy um, who was, he was doing a, um, he wanted to do a show about a director. And so he was basing it on this wow. thing. And, and I got an audition for it. Right. So I went in and he said, to play to me, yourself. Have, yeah. He said, have you ever seen this commercial? No. <laughs> Didn't. And I said, well, yeah, I, I'm that guy. Derivative right? much. And Gee, um, I didn't get the job, but. Um, <laughs> you didn't get the job of playing yourself. No, but my partner, Dave Huban, got the job <laughs> of the director. And then I ended up playing his role okay. in it, which and he was in the original. He was the cameraman. Dave. So Dave was the camera. Dave, Dave Huban, who's one of my members of um, Illustrated Men. So he ended up being the the uh, director, and I ended up being the uh, the cameraman. And because in the actual it. director's mind, you weren't the right you. I wasn't me. <laughs> the role of you. <laughs> <laughs> I have auditioned for stuff where it said the, on the breakdown, it said a Bruce Hunter type, mm. and then I auditioned oh. for it and didn't get the job. Oh you know, my so, goodness! No, so it's, it's pretty. It's a pretty oh, funny the business. Fools. But they sent that Close. out. They sent that out because they were looking for somebody like me, but they didn't want me, right? Ouch! You know, Ouch! To look like somebody like me. So Can that even be that's, legal. That's funny. It doesn't happen a lot, but you know that was that was kind of funny. And, you know, like, they wanted me. They just didn't want me. Right. You know. Well, little do they know. They they do. We we want you to. <laughs> so, as a performer, here you are. You know, able to bring together amazing stories, amazing performances, uh, somehow not living up to being you and, and <laughs> auditioning in the role of you. But as a you, all the years of your life, I mean, humor is something that just runs through your bones. Did your family recognize that there was something different about you? Like, were you that, that kid at the back of the class making everyone laugh? <laughs> uh yes well, our family has always liked humor i mean we're my mother and family are english um i was like the first um first generation uh, in my family uh, as so my brother and sister both we were all born in calgary Great. or in um in canada uh but um my brother and sister were born in Montreal and I was born in Calgary. Okay, so so they dragged me Quebec to the, in Canada, to the cow and then, town. And you're in Cal Calgary, Alberta in Canada. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're all, we all liked humor because uh, we liked English humor. Right. Um, and so I always liked making my mom laugh, you know, because, you know, we were a, a single parent family. So we didn't have a lot of money and, um, but we did have a lot of laughs and, and that was good. Um, Beautiful. So I think um, I remember one of my, like when I was in grade, I think it was probably grade two, one or two. Um, I was in a play. Uh, I think I played a, I played a sparrow. So I was in a big paper mache blue sparrow. Wow. <laughs> like I look like a pear. Right. <laughs> and um and I remember in in the play, you know, they have like the school um, stage, you know, where you've got the the door on the side and the stage comes down the stairs and they would do their presentations in there. But we were doing this this children's play. And and um, I think it was um, anyway, I, I played a, a I played it was a summer play. So I played this sparrow, this blue sparrow. And my job was to fly around right and then go down the front of the stairs and around the side and then uh, into the door and then right. backstage well <clears throat> i did my little flying around my best imitation of a flying bird and then i came down the stairs and went around the side to go in the door and um uh, and the door was locked so oh, no i um i couldn't get the door open Somebody had locked the door. Oh so God. I I started hitting it with my shoulder. Like this As one does. Kid dressed in a blue 
<laughs> going bang up against the door, bang. And the audience started laughing. They thought it was so funny. So I looked out and I started doing it more, right. playing it up, right? mm -hmm. banging it. And the audience was in, was laughing quite a bit. And then someone opened the door and I did a pratfall into the, into the room. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's what I want to do. Mm. You know, that making people laugh like that. Mm. I remember it very clearly yeah, as a child thinking, I really like this. Right. Yeah, Not knowing what an actor was or any of that kind of stuff at the time. But I knew I really enjoyed making people laugh. Right. You know, I, I felt uh, totally accepted and whatever. So that kind of fueled me i think early memories like those kind of things have a lot to do with the direction of your life mm. you know and i think that that affected me so much that i wanted to recreate that that feeling of having them in the palm of my hand and i could entertain them or make them laugh and stuff so you had that in instinctual feeling already of understanding the timing when they once they gave you that cue this is working you knew how to pour on more and the pratfall like <laughs> yeah I was hooked nice you know nice. I was hooked and then in school you know the same thing I always had a uh I always had a a, a joke or I'd always mm. say something to the teacher I'd always have a, a line that I'd come back on and um and I got uh, pretty good at it um which ended up me being pretty fast with my reactions to stuff and I got I got good at doing that even as a kid. So as my life went on, um, that's pretty much how I got through a lot of my um, problems by right. being the funny one, you know, and wow. people would want to be hanging around with the funny guy or they wanted to be on his side. They certainly didn't want to be on the other side because they might look a bit silly. So um, I ended up um, being accepted that way through my humor. Um, that, that can so, open a lot of doors right and it can make uh, for a lot of peaceful waters where you know they weren't so peaceful before if you if you have that ability yeah and people. you wouldn't do it to uh, to make people look stupid like I never did it to the teachers that I made them look dumb I I would I would do it for the joke if 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 the joke was on me I'd play that you know right uh, and they appreciated that and you know mm -hmm. i remember the my teachers would often say you know as they said with most kids i'm sure um he's very smart if he only focused his attention on the schoolwork right as opposed to being <laughs> a smart ass you know but as it turned out being a smart ass paid off better for me than <laughs> paying attention to anything the, else the, thank you the teacher. math equation yeah right thank you for nothing Teacher. Yeah, <laughs> I already had all the tools I needed right here in the little blue bird suit. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that's probably the case with most people is that they have the tools, right. and they but they don't either. They haven't been able to apply them yet at their point in the life, but eventually something happens where they go, "Oh gosh, I'm actually good at this. Right. I'm good at this thing. You know, I'm really good at uh, drawing, or I'm good at." structural design or i'm good at understanding people or whatever the thing is that people get into they find their way somehow by being open to it and uh and usually the universe um gives you the opportunities and then sees if if you take it or not and that was part one of my two-part conversation with bruce hunter We'll upload part two on Tuesday, September 19th, 2023. This special episode is available on Spotify for subscribers only, so please subscribe. We will continue to upload our podcast every Tuesday as usual. show thank you for listening to the very end please remember to subscribe through your streaming service to get more access to our guest interviews also please subscribe on youtube to help support our podcast until next time i'm eva john for cool life podcast thank you for turning me on